people are like, how are you doing short sale? It's like, because the bank needs to get these houses off their books, no matter what, because they still have to take it back in foreclosure. They still have to process it through the red tape. It still has to get put back out on the market and get listed. And that time period is usually two years. You're listening to Ice Cream with Investors, a podcast that is dedicated to teaching you how to better invest your money so that you can live a more intentional life. I'm your host, Matt Four, and it is my goal to teach and empower you to remove the roadblocks to your financial success. All right, Juan, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you again. Yeah, we uh, we were recording on yours, and it was so good that we we're like, "Hey, you need to come on ours." Uh, oh, and, uh, I love it. And you're swamp. in Nashville. You're like in my favorite place. That's right. That's right. Well, you missed some tornadoes we got here the other day, so uh, not sure. Not sure it was my favorite place at that moment. Yeah, I know. They got yeah, they they have a lot out there for sure. Yeah, so I'm glad yep. y'all are safe. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we like to start with the difficult questions here. What's your favorite okay. ice cream? I'm so basic. <laughs> My favorite ice cream is chocolate. That's that's much better than if you said vanilla. I, I have a strong, strong chocolate. distaste against vanilla. God, I love chocolate. I, eat cho- I can put chocolate, ice cream, chocolate on anything in the world. Chocolate is the best. I love it. I love it. Now, are you a toppings gal or do you uh, like it just plain? So, <coughs> I'm, I, yes and no. So, I am a, like if I'm getting like a scoop or something, ice cream, <coughs> just chocolate. But if I'm at a fancy place that can make stuff, I'll get a banana split. Any place like a Dairy Queen or something like that, I'll just go for a whole banana split and have just all the stuff on it. But otherwise, I'm just give me a scoop of chocolate, nothing plain. I love it. I like it. I love I like ice it. cream. I have ice cream in my freezer right now. That's one of my things I like to eat at night. See, we we can't have ice cream in the freezer because it will go so quickly and we'll eat it all the time. So it's like a special occasion when we all go out as a family just to get ice cream. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I was my kids were little, it was a different story. But now it's just me and Bill. So I have drumsticks in my freezer at all times. Drumsticks with like the little caramel thing in the middle. It's like, I love it. So I'm like, mm, I feel like a drumstick. And I don't have to worry about all the kids devouring them. And the next day, the box is completely empty, which is yep. what used to happen when the kids lived at home. <laughs> so yep, I feel I like this thing, there's can... a day coming when you can have ice cream and nobody will eat it but you. Yeah, I love it. Well, tell our <laughs> listeners, what's the scoop? What do you do today? Well, what's the scoop? So today I'm hanging out and I'm talking with one of my favorite people. Uh, I'm in Clinton, Iowa. And as I talked to you about when you were on my show, we are rehabbing this little downtown. So we just arrived where we have a little apartment up on the third, some of them on the third floor overlooking Clinton. And we're working on rehabbing a town. We have uh, like 28 parcels, which I think equates to 22 or three buildings. And we're, uh, we've been away for a couple of years because my husband went through a stem cell bone marrow transplant, which was like a major deal. So we're back and he has a lift and right out the window that I'm in right there, he's on the lift today, up there on the lift, you know, thinking it's just all that scraping the buildings and doing stuff. I'm like, honey, you can hire people to do that. Like, no, I've been waiting to use this lift for two years. So we are working on our buildings all summer. We'll be here for the whole summer. Gotcha. Well, I know people here uh, rehabbing a town and their mind goes to, wow, that seems like a big project. So you didn't start there. Where, where did your real estate journey begin? <laughs> uh, and it, it, listen, to me, sometimes I still think like, what the hell are we doing? I like, guess it's, it's a big, it's a big deal. Even to me, sometimes I walk the streets and go, dang, like, we drove around last night and it's like, I don't know what we're thinking, but it's like so fun and we're in it now. So we're just like, now we're in it to win it, you know? Um, so started off, I was fired from Denny's, which was super fun. And then I got married. And I had a baby. And when my daughter was eight months old, her dad um, took off pretty unexpectedly. So now I have an eight-month-old daughter, and I don't really have any job skills, really. I mostly waited tables. And I'm 30. And I was like, dang, I need to figure out what I'm going to be able to do to raise this child. So it was like one of those come to Jesus moments. And I just decided, and really the thing is, and I always tell people, I, everyone that's listening right now, they're miles ahead of me because I was not even looking to get into real estate. 
I only want to do something where I could work from my home, have my daughter with me because I wanted to be the fun mom, the field trip mom, the brownie mom, the Girl Scout mom, like I, the disco ball mom. I wanted to be that person. I thought, well, just because my ex left doesn't mean I can't still have those things. And I was smart enough to know at 30 that if I took a job and got that security that everyone in my family was like telling me, you got to get security, you need insurance, you need this. I thought, I knew, I knew then that I'd keep that job probably till I was 50 because I'd have the whole job till she grew up. And, you know, I don't know, you're, you're so young. But when I was 30, I thought people that were 50 were like old as dirt and had an actual foot into the grave. I thought, God, by the time I'm 50, I'll barely have any days of my life left. <laughs> And I will have worked a job the whole time. So, of course, now at 65, I'm like, I was a baby when I was 50. And so I just decided to look for something I could do from home. That was the goal. And I didn't really even care what it was as long as it was legal. I mean, I didn't care. It had no, made no difference to me. And I met some people and they were investors. Like, oh, we buy houses, we fix them up, we sell them. I was like, oh, fix them up, sell them. They decorate. Okay, I like to decorate. How hard does decorating be? I'm going to become a decorator. And that truly, truly was what I thought I would be doing. And I tell people all the time, I, I think my best asset then was that I was so naive. Because if I really knew what living in a house and rehabbing a house from yeah. the ground up meant, I'm not sure I would have had the guts to do it. Because I yeah. didn't know. I really, God to hand to God, I thought I was going to decorate houses Fix them up, make them nice, sell them, get another one debt, and just that's why I thought I was going to be doing. So it's like, oh, if you're here listening about real estate now, you're a hundred miles ahead of where I started. But you know, now it's 35 years later. My daughter's 35. I've done thousands of deals, and we're rehabbing a town. So yeah, where did okay. you where did you first do your first uh, flip or rehab? Where was that market? I lived in Florida. So I am from uh, Ohio. I think I might have told you. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. And you're too young to remember, but there'll be folks on here that remember the blizzard of 78. And it was this massive, massive blizzard. And I happened to be working at, as a waitress at the hotel by the airport. And we were all snowed in for days. Everyone that was flying was snowed in with us. Everyone snowed in. And we're just working around the clock. And, and I mean, it's kind of fun because they put us all up in rooms. and they were pretty open about, yeah, you can have some drinks and you know, whatever. But, but I wrecked my car twice that year. I fell on the ice once and smacked the back of my head. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know what? When this ship melts, I'm freaking moving to Florida. And so it was the year after high school. And the next summer rolled around and I graduated in 77. And that winter was the blizzard. Of, and there's shirts still to this day to say, I survived the blizzard of 78. But that blizzard prompted me to move to Florida. So I had been living in Florida since I was 19. Still have a house there now. So I don't know, do the math, like 45 years or something like that. Yeah. So I started in South Florida in Palm Beach County, mostly. Still have a house down there in Delray Beach. And so I did, for 10 years, I did 100% of my business in Florida. How did you, did you have any mentors at the time? Or did you just move down there and say, hey, I'm just going to go do this real estate thing? Oh, no, no, no. I moved down there. No, I was like 19. I, I worked in restaurants and bars and waited tables like in my 20s. It was the 80s. Like if anyone, if anyone was around the 80s, like they totally get what I'm saying right now. But it was the 80s and it was very decadent and there was an extreme amount of drugs and a lot of partying and like the funnest thing you could do as, you know, a young person would be like working one of the nightclubs and all these famous people and now, the 80s, it, it was the decade. So when I had Ayla, she was born in 88. So I was in Florida for actually a full decade before um, I got married, met her dad, you know, had a baby. Yeah. So I was 30. So at 30, you're like, ah, you know, I really don't want to work in a nightclub anymore. I mean, that's like, and plus I'm not partying, like, you know, everything. I'm just nice. I want to be a mom. So... Um, I really thought I was just going to kind of be a stay at home and raise kids and be married. Like that was kind of my plan. And that changed really quickly. So I was like, well, I'm going to have to put on my big girl panties yeah. and figure something else out. Now, of course, my family's like, move back to Ohio. And I'm like, no. Yeah. And I go, Did oh, the blizzard once. 
you can live in your old room from high school. And I'm like, I was honestly, I remember the day I was sitting there thinking, I was at the beach and I thought I could move back to Ohio and live in my old room that still has green shag carpet and my posters <laughs> with my child under my dad's house and my dad is my house, my rules. I could just walk out in that water and I could hope that a shark would eat me. And honestly, at that moment, I thought the shark sounded like a better option. Yeah. So I was like, all right, well, I don't want to get eaten by sharks. I sure shit don't want to move back to Ohio. So I'm just going to figure it out. Yeah. So I had a lot so, of gumption and, and I was naive. And I tell people all the time, I said, if I knew now what that first deal, my first deal was actually where I, I moved in, the homeowner moved out and we agreed to split the deal with no paperwork. It's like, if someone came to me and said, Hey, do you want to meet a homeowner? We had a hug and a handshake and we talked it out. And this is what we're doing. I'd be like, are you out of your mind? You're not doing that deal. The hell's yeah. wrong with you? But that's what I did. So there was nobody, you know, and then the only person was Carlton Sheets was on TV. There was no anybody. There were no seminars. There was no internet. There was no Google. There was certainly no Zoom or anything like that. And there wasn't anyone traveling, like doing real estate. So when I met these other guys, I was like, oh, okay. They fix up, they fix up cars. They rehab cars. They sell them and they fix up houses. I was like, oh. I could do that. That sounds like fun. And I really loved it. I made 22000 on my first deal. And at that time, 22000 was an entire year salary for people. And I was like, oh, I have a year. This is easy. In the bank. This is easy. I'm going to do it again. And I mean, it was not easy. I, there, my, learning curve, my learning curve was long. Yeah. So obviously we get spoiled today with all the software tools and the uh, ability to go out and find deals and all those sorts of things today. It's more competitive because of that, but at the same time, it's a lot easier. How did you go find deals um, when you were first getting started like that? <laughs> well, the people I met, they said, well, you got to remember, there's no mapping. There's no Google Maps. There's nothing exists yet. This, there's, pagers aren't even out yet. So I'm like pre-pager. So I'm like a dinosaur from the day. So at that time, they said, oh, yeah, you go to the courthouse and ask for the foreclosure files. And you write down all the addresses. Then we use those map books. And I don't know if any of y'all ever tried to use mm -hmm. those map books. I thought those were oh, going to yeah. be the death of me. They're, I mean, even today when I see what I'm like, I can just feel my chest clench of anxiety. <laughs> they are. It took me a while. They're, they're hard to use. So... I would hand map them out and I would just go knock on doors and I had like a baby hanging on my hip and I would just go knock on doors and, and I didn't know scripts. I didn't know what to say. So I would just say, Oh, Hey, uh, I see you're in foreclosure and I'd like to buy your house if you want to move out. And people would slam the door, slam the door, slam the door. And then finally this woman, Barbara, she's like, yeah, I'd like to work with you. So we both just stood there because I thought. Never I had this happen. Hey, yeah. <laughs> No one's ever said yes. I've never gotten past the door being slammed. And I was like, oh, well, uh, so I, I'm going to fix up the house and we can sell it and we can split the profit. And she's like, okay. And so she moved out. I moved in. I rehabbed it because once I decorated everything, I was like, wow, this house looks crappy. Like it needs, it needs kitchens. It needs bathrooms. It needs a lot. And, uh, so I put in new carpet. I made some, I had custom, everyone had custom made blinds still in the late eighties. And once I did that and like decorated it, I was like, the kitchen is yellow. The bathrooms are like avocado. And, and I was like, oh, the paint, the house was like, Ugh. so I thought, okay, well, so I'm going to have to fix stuff up, not just fix it, fix stuff up. So I went to the Home Depot. I took those classes. And they, I like took a tile class and I measured the kitchen. I went back to the guy and said, I have this much space. And he helped me pick out the tile and the grout and like the thin set and little spacers. And I tiled a kitchen. I was like, oh, hey, look at that. That looks amazing. And I tiled the bathrooms and, and I actually like tiling. So I tiled the kitchen countertops and up the back wall. And I was like, I'm a tiling monster. And I learned how to build screens and I, Ayla be sleeping at night. I'd be making screens for the windows and I'd be putting cabinets together. 
So I was in the house with her. She was with me. And when she'd be napping or whatever, I'd be building and working on stuff. And like I said, I sold it. Uh, I sold it in four days, actually. I put it on the market. It was my first wow. house. Four days. I got someone to buy it. And I painted, <laughs> I painted the house pink. Now, at the time, I, well, I still can. This is one thing I do not have a superpower. You know, this little paint, like a paint chart that has a piece of paint that's like that yep. big. I still, to this day, do not possess the ability to look at this much paint and then imagine it on a grander scale. So mauve was a really big thing. So I thought, I'm going to make this house like just the palest, droppest shade of pink. And then I'm going to put on some um, maroon, like, uh, you know, shutters and the door and, you know, the, the darker color. And I'm telling you, when I painted that house, Matt, I was like, damn, this paint's bright. I hope it gets darker as it dries. <laughs> and I mean, when it was dry, it was like Malibu Barbie pink. Wow. And I thought, oh, I don't know. What have I done? I mean, it's like, it's like pink. Like, my, it's pink. And the guy that bought it, God love him. He goes, he and his wife love the house. So, so I got spoiled in my first deal. They were fully FHA qualified. They had the money. They loved it. They got qualified. Like we closed really fast. And I was like, this is so easy. But you know, all deals aren't like that. But the guy said to me, he says, Juan, listen, I appreciate everything you've done. The house looks amazing, but I'm not moving into this house. So we're, we repaint it. I am not living in the Barbie house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they painted like a tan and I went by there like a decade ago and they still live there. Wow. Yeah. I took this. Hey, let me go show you my first house. I knocked on the door and they are like, oh my God. And I said, hey. And so they let us in and they're like, no, you did a great job. We had the house still looks great. So obviously, um, one question I have for you is the the idea of moving in with a newborn and kind of learning all of this on the fly. Um, she's now older, 35, I think you mentioned. How does she yeah. she obviously doesn't remember that time, but what is what is her experience of you kind of learning on the fly just to figure it out? Like that's very inspirational, I think. Yeah, well, you know, I couldn't afford to like live over here and pay rent and fix up a house. And I did my first two houses fully on credit cards. But no one in my family would help me because they thought, girls don't re out houses. You don't need to get a real job. And so I had zero support. And, you know, which was typical back in then. I mean, in the 70s, and 80s, women, at least in Ohio, we were encouraged to get out of high school, get married, work at a factory, have babies. Like that's what it was. And I was like, I don't want to do any of that. <laughs> so, so, um, she does, she has memories of being like three and four. So what I would do is like, if I'm in like a place like this, I would let her uh, paint on all the walls. I said, so I would do that last. I said, you can paint on all the walls. So I would fix up the whole house and then I would do the paint and carpet last. And so she had little paint brushes and little paint sets. And she was, I remember just walking around the house and drawing, because she's only like, you know, that tall. So she only yeah. draws this high. And she's, I remember, and I, so to keep her entertained, and she was really artsy, I was like, you can paint on the walls and draw things. And she'd be in the house all day, drawing and painting and putting her handprints on things. And and she'd help me with stuff. I was like, here, help mommy roll this screen out. And she'd help me roll things in and out. And by the time she got to kindergarten, uh, I was living in a house I was rehabbing, but I stayed because she was in school. So then I didn't want to, because all the houses, even though they were in Palm Beach County, they were different school districts. Yeah. So that house we stayed in and we lived in that house for uh, like five years or so to we moved into the house that, that we still have now to this day. And that house actually had built. It was a vacant lot. It was the last vacant land on Lake Ida in Delray Beach, Florida. And they were building and I was like, wow. I could have a house built from scratch and not have to fix it up and not worry about what's happened and when things are going to go wrong. So I had this house. I went and picked out a model home. I was like, I'll take that one. And I still have that house today. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I know um, doing some research and having some conversations with you uh, that you got really big into short sales uh, mm. kind of to help you find deal flow. Uh, we're going into an interesting part of the market right now. And I would I would love to hear, first of all, if our listeners don't know what a short sale is, could you quickly define that and then talk a little bit about how you got into those? I will. So I am actually uh, have the registered trademark on short sales as it applies to real estate investing. So when I realized I was in something that was like really new, I trademarked it. 
and I also trademark the Queen of Short Sales. <laughs> so, so I have like a registered trademark on those things. Um, so now we're going back to like 91, 92, and I'm still rehabbing, but I've also discovered wholesaling. So now I'm rehabbing some and I'm wholesaling some. And, and I remember the first deal, the way it started, this, uh, I had this house, I was going to wholesale, I was making $5,000. So, you know, when you're still kind of broke and you're a single mom, I just, anyone, I'm sure anybody, if you think you're getting a check for $5,000, mentally, you have already spent the $5,000. So I got a, like a closing statement, uh, maybe the day before, and the bank had tacked on $4,000 in fees. And I was just like, oh. I'm going to make a thousand bucks. I don't have another deal lined up. I'm rehabbing some houses. I need some money. So I called the bank. I said, listen, this is what you told me the approximation, the closing costs were. And then you sent me this official one and there's $4,000 extra fees. So I need you to knock those fees off or I, I have to walk away. I can't close the deal. And she's like, well, hold on. She just puts me on hold. She's like, hold on. She's like, she's like, okay, we'll take those fees off. Like, just like that. And I was like, she just took off $4,000. So then my thought was, well, I'm going to do this on the next deal. So the next deal I get, they send me the thing. I say, hey, I need you to knock off a few fees. And they're knocking off all these fees. And I'm like, oh, this is, I don't know what I stumbled into. This is the most amazing thing. And so then a couple deals in, I had a house and I was buying it for 60 and I already had it wholesaled for 90. So I was like, oh, it's going to be a $30,000 deal. But the house needed work and it was worth like, maybe 175 or something like that. But it still needed quite a bit of work. So I thought, it's one of the banks I've worked with before. I thought, I'm going to call this girl. And I'm going to see if I can get her to take off some of what's owed, like the principal. Because I had always just been asking for fees. So I said, listen, the house has this and that. It's got extra things. I don't think my buyer's not really not wanting to close. I, you know, I, I really would like to just buy this house for, um, I can only pay 30000 this is sixty thousand dollars, and I'm asking for thirty. So I'm like, hey, I kind of got to go bigger at home. So she calls back like the next day. She says, "Well, we can take thirty six. And I was like, "What?" Done. Hold the phone. I'm like, "Okay, well, sure. I uh, I need you to." So I'm so excited. I'm like, "I need you to put that in writing, and you know, we're going to close on this day." And she puts up in writing. I was like. So I still somewhere have that first acceptance letter for $36,000. And I'm like, okay, so now I'm, I'm still wholesaling it for 90. So I just added all this extra money in by making a couple phone calls. And so that deal closed. I called the girl back and said, listen, you taken some fees off before. Like what, what is this called? And like, if there was no actual name yet, Matt, that's so weird. And she's like, well, we call it discounting the mortgage, discounting shorting, short sales. Like we don't really have like a locked in term. Basically, we're just discounting the note. And I was like, okay, there's not a locked in term. And some of them are calling it shorts, shorting, short sales, discounting, discounting the note. And I thought, I like short sales. So I, I started calling them short sales. Hey, I'm calling to do a short sale. Like, oh, okay. And then I trademarked as I thought, I'm going to make this a thing. And I actually wrote the very first like little training program like this, like the first little training program for real estate investors on short sales. I wrote the first one. So I copy wrote it, I trademarked it, I trademarked the name. And then I got asked to write a book, which I called Short Sale Pre-Foreclosure. And then like the whole short sale industry spiraled out from that. So I'm super proud. Like I'm literally like the founder of short sales as far so, as making but, but, it a thing. And, and let's clarify. So a short sale is when a bank is foreclosing oh, on the property. And yeah, sorry. Yeah, so ahead. a short sale, yeah, I got into that. Because, you know, when I think about it, it's like, damn, I'm really proud of myself. That's like, that's a thing. I helped, I helped, I, you know, discover an industry. I will tell you uh, as quick side note, in 2008, I bought my first property. In 2009, I bought my first property right after the GFC. Um, and I remember at the time, many people were like, you should look for short sales as your first property. So to tie yeah. this conversation in a full loop, the fact that you invented the term and and my first real estate experience buying a personal home 
interacted with that. So that's, uh, that's yeah, very they, interesting. They, they got- hey, fellow investors, before we dive into our next segment of the show, I wanted to take a quick moment to talk to you about a fantastic opportunity for you to invest with me. As you know, here at Ice Cream with Investors, I'm passionate about real estate investing and helping you navigate the exciting world of wealth creation through real estate. And that's why for the first time, I'm thrilled to tell you about an opportunity for you to invest alongside of me. Over the past three years, I've been investing in multifamily, mobile home parks, car washes. I've even become the bank and lent out money to fellow real estate investors on a short-term basis. And now you can come join me. If you'd like to jump on a call and learn more about this opportunity, head to icecreamwithinvestors.com slash invest and find a time for us to connect. And now back to the show. All the way back. So a short sale. So like, let's just say I was everyone is listening. I was trying to buy Matt's house and he has um, a $200,000 house, but he owes 200,000 and you're in foreclosure and you know, you're losing the house and I can't pay 200 for it. So I call the bank up and I say, Hey, I need you to do a short sale, which means the bank agrees to take less. So first I have the house under contract. So I have Matt, we have a contract on your house. I'm buying your house. I've already talked to you. How much money do you need to move with? You're like, I don't know. Give me five grand. You owe what your health is worth. You're losing in the foreclosure sale, the sheriff sale, though, whatever you guys call it, the trustee sale. But I just say it's foreclosure sale, you know, to make it easy. Mm-hmm. And I call the bank. I said, hey, I need to buy the house for a hundred. And these are all the reasons why. And the ba- bank agrees to sell the house to me for less. So I'm buying the house for less with the bank's approval. So I'm still buying it from the homeowner. I'm paying less. The bank sends me an acceptance letter that says we will accept a hundred thousand dollars as payment in full. The homeowner can't receive any sale proceeds. This letter is good for thirty days. Da da da. And you you just meet the qualifications, and then you buy the house and you buy it for less. Yeah. So essentially, the ba- the buyer, the seller owes one hundred fifty thousand on it to the bank. You are buying it for a hundred thousand dollars, and there the bank is taking. Less than the that what they owe the full in value. lieu of transferring the deed. Yep. The bank is yep. taking less than the full value as payment in full. So here's the thing. If I just have a second for a side note, um, when you're helping a homeowner and you're doing a short sale on their house, you have to realize, and I did not realize this in the beginning. Like this happened to me a couple times before I knew what was happening. The bank will send the homeowners either a deficiency judgment or a 1099. So my first couple short sales, these homeowners called me up like a year later and said, hey, Juan, we got this deficiency. I was like, for what? And I called the bank back and they said, oh, yeah, no, we don't just we don't just lose the money. We write it off. So the homeowner either gets a deficiency or a 1099 because the bank claims it as income to the homeowners. So my first couple of people that called me, I called the bank up. I was so livid and I didn't know. That's the thing is I didn't know what I didn't know. So my first homeowners had like $150,000 deficiency judgment. And I was like, shoot. So I, I'm like, how do they get rid of that? And I said, well, they have to pay it. We can take less um, or they could do bankruptcy. And, you know, so I started learning. So now, or they get a 1099. And so uh, you guys write this down. There's an IRS form called a 982. 982 is a 982 IRS form. Basically, it's a, a insolvency kind of a document. And if someone loses their house in foreclosure and then they get a big 1099, they can usually wipe all that out if they go have someone do their taxes for them because they lost their house in foreclosure. So between that and 1099, because otherwise if someone gets like $100,000 1099 and they don't know about the IRS one, they owe like $25,000 in taxes. Yeah. So the bank doesn't actually take it as payment in full. They take it as a payment in full with the homeowner responsible for the balance gotcha and that gotcha. took me like five short sales to learn that but then i was like dang like the banks don't tell you so i didn't know until people called me and, and i was like Ugh. so but yeah. now i know so now i know how to handle it in advance so do you see um, the short sale market today? I mean, typically when you see short sales is when pricing has appreciated so rapidly and then people become underwater on their mortgage that they can't pay it anymore and the bank needs to do something with it. Do you still see a short sale industry today or deals happening from a short sale? You know, the thing is, and I think part of that is that people, uh, I don't think a lot of people understand like a short sale is not done because of the market. A short sale is done for the benefit of the bank. So 
even on a good market, there's still people that are going into foreclosure, losing jobs. Someone's dying. Someone has an illness. Someone gets a job transfer. The reasons for foreclosure never change. Now, something like COVID, yeah, that gives you massive amounts. But like a housing crash in 2008, that gives you more than normal. But in the regular day in, day out of life, the reasons for foreclosure are exactly the same. So the bank, the bank's point of view is they, every time they have a defaulted asset, they have something called a loan loss reserve. So if you have a $200,000 house, the bank has two to $400,000 house and another account against that one that they can't lend that money on. So that homeowner misses 12, 15 payments and they have all bankruptcy. Then, you know, two or three years go by, the, home, the bank is just sitting on money. They're not collecting any money. It's on the quarterly reports, the year end reports. It's on all this stuff from the banks, from the financial backside of the bank. It's easier for them just to get rid of it and write it off and be done with it. And then they have more defaulted assets piling up month after month after month. So even yeah. when the markets are going crazy, people are like, how are you doing short sales? It's like, because the bank needs to get these houses off their books, no matter what, because they still have to take it back at foreclosure. They still have to process it through the red tape. It still has to get put back out on the market and get listed. And that time period is usually two years. So for two years, yep. they're getting yep. zip. And then they got zip from the homeowners before. So they're better off just to say, yeah, we'll take less and we'll just send you a 1099 and then they're off. They're done. So how are you finding deals today? Are you still scouring through foreclosures? Do you start with markets? Do you have relationships with specific banks to do REOs? Like, how are you finding deals today? Well, honestly, I, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm like, it's it, people overcomplicate. We just go on to the courthouse, like go onto the website and all the foreclosures are right there. They're public record. They've always been public record. Now, before mm -hmm. this amazing thing called the internet, they would publish the foreclosures in a newspaper. But still to this day, all the banks are still required to publish the foreclosures in a newspaper. Like in Denver, we have a paper that's called um, the, uh, I'm going blank. I think it's called the Denver Leader or something like that. So all the foreclosures, the divorces, so a, a foreclosure is a lawsuit. So yep. all the divorces, foreclosures, adoptions, all the lawsuits are published in a legal paper in every county in the whole entire country. So you can either subscribe to that paper. And in most places now, I mean, even in our little town up in the mountains, we can still get it online. You can go online and there's all the foreclosures, the divorces, the probates. Um, if you go to the federal building, it's all the bankruptcies. So it's all public record. Yeah. And that's... Um you say it's never going to be the New York Times. It's never going to be the Tennessee and like the major papers. It's always going to be a subset. And I think I live in Sumner County, which is just north of Davidson County and here in Nashville. And I think it's called the Sumner Ledger or something like that, where all this is published. Yeah. So if you do a couple quick Google searches, you'll find it. <clears throat> now, yeah. some people can pay a service to compile it for you. And we've just been doing it so long and I've just done it so long. I'm just, I just go online and look for it, but we do yeah. other things, you know, we run ads, we, um, have, uh, ads on Facebook. We go on Craigslist. We mail postcards. Like we do a lot of other things, but the easiest thing is just get online, go to your County and just print them out. And in our counties around Denver, it has, uh, and most counties, it has the name, the address, what they owe, the name of the bank and the sale date. So if the sale dates in, you know, three or four weeks, and we don't care what they owe. If they owe more than what the house is worth, we still talk to them because I know the short sale is an option. Yeah. And if they have a yep. ton of equity, everybody and their brother is knocking on the door and hounding them down. So sometimes it's easier to go after the ones that appear not to have equity because nobody chases them. And they're Do often you, uh... people. Is the only market you're in around Denver or do you, are you in other markets as well? Um, so it's ironic because we used to work in uh, Colorado as far as rent rehabbing and stuff. Florida, Colorado, uh, Tennessee, Texas, Iowa. But now that we're like here and we have all these buildings, we're focused in Clinton, Iowa right now. So Bill and I are not rehabbing anything. Now our son, he rehabs in Denver and he buys rentals out here. 
Because in Denver, I mean, like a house is kind of in the hood. It's like a four hundred thousand dollar yeah. house. It's gotten and it gotten know, expensive. Oh my god, they were up to like five fifty, six hundred, and I'd be like, "It's a t- it's a this big. How is that possible?" But here in Iowa, here in Clinton, you can buy like for sixty grand, you can buy a really nice two story, three bed, one bath, or three bed, two bath for a rental. So and that you know that excuse me, you can buy for like sixty. They rent for like eleven hundred. So if I have four hundred thousand dollars, I can buy one in Denver. And maybe get eighteen hundred dollars a month out of it. But I can come to Iowa and I can buy five and get a thousand dollars a month. So I always tell people like you have to get out of the mindset that you have to invest in your backyard. My backyard is too expensive. Yeah. For rentals. Now for rehabbing, it's amazing. But for rentals, my backyard and in Florida, you know, I mean, shoot, the rentals in Delray Beach, we used to be able to buy rentals for fifty grand. Those same houses right now are like 250, 300. It's like, oh, I wish I still had some of those rentals. Why did I yeah. sell those? Yeah, I can't imagine buying uh, rentals in Telray Beach for 50 grand. That's, oh, I, well, I it think was I, a hood for a while. You know, it was a hood yeah. for a long time. And the whole Atlantic Avenue, it was all boarded up. It was like an actual hood. And so when this properties came up on Lake Ida, I saw an ad you know, in the paper because, again, we only had the newspaper. And it said the last vacant lot land on Delray Lakes or Lake Ida were building. And I was like, oh, they're building houses. So I, I didn't even know this, that the area was there because it was just vacant, swampy land. So I go over there and, and it goes halfway around the lake and they're building the subdivision with like 300 houses. I was the third person that moved in there. So I was there. There was a guy directly across the street from me and someone like two streets over. And like nobody lived in there for like a year. Cause they were, they'd sell a couple and then they build them and they, you know, they raise the price and they sell a couple more lots and you know how they do. And which that was my first time learning about that too. And I thought, I don't know, I mean, Delray's rough. The whole downtown is just, it's like a hood still, but I could see the potential. And I saw that like down by the railroad, just so you're, so for those that don't know, now Delray's voted like the cutest it's beautiful. town in yeah. South Florida or something. It's really stunningly beautiful and i'm really proud to say i watched every single inch of that grow so we bought a couple of houses that were zone light commercial so we bought a couple commercial buildings houses that were light commercial so we bought a few of those and so down on the main drag i mean you're talking a whole mile that was just like really just a hood and boarded up and a couple uh, a couple of gay guys opened up this little art gallery this little coffee shop next to like a place where people stopped in and got their morning paper and coffee and people started going. And then like across the street, someone opened up another little restaurant and just right on that one corner, like another little restaurant. So like this little four or five house buildings. And then next thing you know, the whole thing just exploded and it went crazy. And now it's probably some of the most expensive property and it's super expensive to shop and eat there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I remember it like back in the day, when the two guys opened a little art gallery and I was like, oh my God, there's life on. So I would go down like, ah, there's life on Atlantic Avenue. Come on, keep building. And people just built it up and now it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, Duane, That's what I we're hoping to be cognizant. Just... Same thing, like, it's kind of like, you know, boarded up. I mean, it's a lot, I gotta tell you, I haven't really been back much for two years. It's very bustly down here now. Yeah. Compared to when we started. And the property values in this little downtown area have gone up 48%. That's it's, because the it's drivers, not, the nice to know the Nice to own the entire city when uh, property values are going up 50%. <laughs> ah, we, own, we own a small part, but we own enough yeah. to control the vote on all the things that are going to happen. So, Yeah. Well, Duana, I want to change this now to our last round. We're calling this the fourth yeah. toppings. Our first one is... What is your favorite book or what is a book you've read recently that's given you a paradigm shift? Gosh, I have to be honest. I have not read any investing books for a while. I am reading books with my granddaughter. So we're reading Horse Tail Hollow. <laughs> okay. Hey, we uh... But you know what? They're really great because I forgot like how much fun it is to have your imagination and to be a kid and just be like, Oh, there's fairies and we're in Pixie Hollow. And 
So for the last, honestly, for the last two years, I only read with my granddaughter. I like it. I like it. We're reading no, um, Whose Fart Is It Anyways or something like that. Yeah, they're so fun. The Horse Tail Hollow books, uh, Kiki Thorpe is her name. She is from Denver. And she has, a, it's a series of like 15 books we're on. Uh, it's our second like round of books. But they're really fun because, you know, like I forget just like, it's so nice. Like I, we as adults, we just forget to be childlike. So yeah. I think, so I am reading Horse Tail Hollow series, but um, so the, I'm going to make a point of it that it's helped me because it's made me just get back to like remembering how much fun things are and that we're too intense and focused on things. And kids are just, that's why they're so great. Their imagination's everywhere. Yep. Yep. And Our second one. Just never hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Our second one is what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, the best piece of advice I've ever received, I would have to say, gosh, I've received so much really good advice. I think one of the uh, best pieces was just way back when I was first kind of starting. P someone had said to me, don't listen to all the negative people in your life because they just want to hold you down to where they're at. It might even have been a book I read. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm having right now. People saying, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. Come back home. That's stupid. Girls don't do that. And someone either told me or I went to like a Tony Robbins seminar or something. And I just remember maybe it was a Tony Robbins seminar that just being impressed on me for days and reading a book like, yeah, I need to not listen to other people. I need to do what I think is the right thing and just trust myself because if I fail, I can get a job. But if I get a job, I already failed. Yeah. Yep. Uh, easier said than done sometimes to trust yourself, though. It is really hard, especially, especially you know, in the late 80s when I don't have family really in Florida. I mean, my sister is down there now. My mom is down there by now. But I don't have any people in my family that are wealthy or have made money or done any of that stuff. I'm like the lone wolf by myself. And there was a lot of days I thought, man, I don't know if I should be doing this. I was like, well, but if I don't, I have to get a job. So what the hell? Keep going. Our third one is, what are you most proud of in your life? Gosh, I don't know. I think my family, my kids, my grandkids. You know, we're we're officially, Bill and I are the first uh, two people in both sides of our family to ever become millionaires. <clears throat> and so we're teaching our children, don't work for other people, work for yourself, invest for yourself. Or even our little grandkids, we've given them candy machines and little machines here and there to like start learning about investing and money and things like that. So I think I, at the end of the day, I'm really most proud of like uh, my kids and how I raised them. And I was a really great mom and I, and I started generational wealth. So I'm really proud yeah. about that because, you know, I'm always like, well, why did one of my grandparents not do this? Or why did one of Bill's grandparents not do that? Like Bill's uncle, great uncle, or however many greats you go back, invented the four-wheel drive, invented the four-wheel drive, and then gave it to the military. It's like, but if they kept that, think about the money. So yeah. I'm proud of the fact that, that we were the ones that stepped out and started a whole new line in our family. That's a really good answer and not one we've heard on the show yet. So I, I, I respect that answer. No, no. All three of my kids have rentals and like my daughter's traveling the whole world. She just took off for a year. She's traveling the whole world right now. And, um, <clears throat> and they're house sitting. They're house sitting all over the world on a one year thing. Uh, my other daughter, she works for a company that's um, Insomniac, which is a, like a, they do music festivals and she travels the whole world for that. And my son's got four kids and he's got 10 rentals and, you know, they go on cruises and they do all this stuff. I'm just like, oh. My kids, right yeah. after my own heart right there. And then my little grandbabies, forget about it. They're adorable. Well, our fourth and final one is, if you could sit down and eat a bowl of ice cream with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Golly. I think <laughs> this is probably going to be the weirdest answer you've ever gotten. I swear to God, I think I would sit down with Eve and say, listen, girl, let me just talk to you for a minute here. Because when you bite that apple, you're going to ruin everything for all of humanity. So let me just talk some sense into you. Don't trust the devil. <laughs> I swear, I that, think that would be my answer. 
I would again, say humanity. Most, again, the most unique answer we've gotten so far to that. <laughs> it's like, no, don't do well, it. Duan, fantastic uh, opportunity to have you on the show here. I appreciate the time. If our listeners wanted to learn more about you, reach out to you, get in touch with you, where is the best place we could point them? So they, y'all can go to Dwanderful, D-W-A-N-D-E-R-F-U-L, Dwanderful.com. If you opt in, you'll get a little ebook called Flip Your Way to a Fortune. And I also have a little ebook on short sales. So opt in, get some free stuff, and watch my podcast. Awesome. We will link all those in the show notes. And then Duan, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, everyone. It's so good to catch up with you, Matt. Thank you for listening to Ice Cream with Investors. If you like what we serve you here, it would mean the world to me if you would like, subscribe, and leave a review on your favorite podcast app.